and we are now uh, live uh, here uh, with New Europe. And this is the second event that we're doing on the personal, local, and glo global impact on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're very happy here to have here with us today uh, Antonio Lopez Isturiz, who's the EBP's uh, Secretary General, the European People's Party is the biggest European political family in Europe. Um, and so we're, we're very happy to have him with us. Uh, Tono, you're currently in Brussels. You're not back home in Spain. No, uh, the seat of the place where I work is here. It's the European Parliament, is the uh, European People's Party. And uh, that's the place I have to be right now. Uh, is the best place where I can help and where I can bring my uh, knowledge after all these political years managing different crises in the Spanish government in the past, in uh, successive European governments. Uh, I think this is the place where I can be more helpful. And can you tell me what life is like at the moment? What's it like to be called upon to do politics in the current crisis? And how are you doing personally? I know it can't be easy for you. Um, it's not easy for anyone. Uh, usually I hear a lot of blaming about politicians and so on. May I speak for hundreds or thousands of politicians that they are doing now their work without any publicity, that they are helping to maintain some kind of order and uh, a system, democratic system in Europe and in our European countries. I say this in times where uh, I see a lot of attraction, you know? by regimes uh, that are not democratical and uh, they are doing propaganda and all this story. And uh, that's why I want to praise, I praise everybody, even, you know, I mean, for, of course, health workers here in, in Europe and everywhere, you know, uh, police, uh, uh, supermarket ladies that are working right now as we speak. Why not also even ET people? That they are in charge of technology of the new technologies that you know they are i'm sure they're doing the extra mile these days so that we can have this kind of contacts and that we can all keep connected in these very worrisome times uh, for them i want to say that uh, there are politicians that uh, they have the knowledge the expertise they have driven to uh, crisis here in europe many times no crisis no crisis like this one this is different, this is tragic, lives are at stake, and this is when more than ever uh, the call has to be made to people uh, to keep their works, to keep their, you know, all, the, all their efforts uh, to keep the system going on. Uh, if there were some people young that now they are having doubts about doing a political career, after what they're listening in the media, everywhere about this, please do not let our countries become regimes like China, like Russia, like others. We are fighting here for democracy. Politicians are not perfect. That is absolutely clear. No one is, perfect. even these leaders in these regimes. But uh, it is a common effort of thousands of people that right now, town councillors, uh, regional ministers, national ministers, governments, it's, an, it's, it's an, an effort of thousands of people that are not seen in the front page of the media that are keeping us together. Although, I'm sure we'll speak about that, we wish there was more unity than we are finding. This is a That's political a we have to work for unity, for coordination, and to do the work to exterminate this virus and to immediately think about the future on how to improve economy, employment. This is a, a work that we have to do all together. So, I mean, you, you mentioned unity, and of course, one of the criticisms uh, that you, you see coming from citizens, especially from the European Union, is that we're not showing this unity. Uh, fr from your perspective, how is Europe doing? Are we doing enough to come together? Europe is reacting the same way. I have seen many crises, I told it before. Uh, this is a different crisis. This is the crisis. But I have lived many before. I have to say publicly, we didn't admit before, but we have to do it now. This European Union has been constructed throughout this crisis. Only when the crisis came, 
member states, which are the real power game players in this story. They are the ones that they have the last say in this European Union. They decide always when there is a crisis, they start reacting in a chaotic, uh, egoistical way. And, uh, and then when they see that this is not working, then they rely in coordination made from Brussels. As, a, as an example now, what happened in the European Commission. At the beginning, all the countries they started to do at the, at the beginning of this pandemic, pandemic, they all started to do wild things, closing frontiers without warnings, I mean, it was chaos. And then, and then when they saw that the, there could be the beginning of more problems, they decided to coordinate now throughout the Commission and the Council. Just an example, trucks. This is essential now. The trucks have to pass through our borders. Food coming from the agriculture of Spain or France has to arrive to other countries where people need to see this food in the supermarkets. When the member states decided to, without any warning, without any permission to close their borders, they put a stake and at risk the essential of, uh, of, of, of first-hand help of food coming to people throughout Europe. But then the European Commission started to speak about the green lanes, where the trucks can pass the frontiers speedily and they don't have to do miles of lines in order to pass frontiers. This is essential to keep people that they are now in their homes in lockdown, uh, to keep them the supermarkets uh, full so they cannot be more hysteria about this. Uh, uh, these are the kind of things that right now the European Union is being called by member states to do. They did not do at the beginning, but this has always been the case. And now member states, some of them did right, some others not. I'm not going to blame now. Time for blaming will come afterwards. Which governments were okay or which governments were not okay with the management of this crisis. But now we have to concentrate in finding these solutions. In the European Parliament last week, we voted already for the freezing of the slots for the uh, airli airlines throughout Europe. We know that the airlines have been struck and they are very weak in this kind of crisis. And uh, it's not only about airlines, it's the tourism, it's the economical component of all this that we have to save. So we are already uh, working on that. Also in opening lines of credit, of funds for member states that they need more right now. Also future plans to fight against one thing that, of course, is not leaving us many sleep these days is the question of unemployment that is rising widely throughout Europe, like in the rest of the world. But the rest of the world are not so ambitious. I am ambitious about Europe. We have to do programs to control and afterwards to regain our uh, stability in the, uh, in the uh, employment market. Can I ask you, you're obviously in contact with a lot of leaders uh, from around Europe, I imagine particularly from the EPP family. What do you uh, suggest to them as a course of action at the moment? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm right now, it was last week that we started to have uh, video conferences with ministers, with commissioners from the family of the EPP, with, let's say, uh, actors, uh, that they have power right now to make decisions. And uh, I see now from what I told you before, uh, from a certain discoordination at the beginning, I see the willing from all of them now to coordinate much better. We can do it from DPP, we humbly can help also European institutions. And we are doing so, like the Commission, like the Council, we are offering also our coordination. That in our case is, uh, I think that everybody that knows DPP knows very well, is far much more prepared and, uh, and effective than other political families in the European Union. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I just wanted to mention that uh, Tono is one of the people that we've included in the latest edition of Our World. It's our 10th anniversary edition. And I want to thank you very much for participating in that. 
Um, for our, our viewers who haven't seen that, I do invite you to, to navigate to you know, www.rworld.co where you can see it and read his article. It's very, very interesting. Um, moving on in, in our discussion, um, I wanted to, to bring in the issue of China a little bit because in the last few days, where, whereas we had been seeing a quite uh, unified, let's say, approach towards China, which tended to be one of sympathy, compassion, and uh, positive uh, attitude. In the past few days, we've seen the US, the UK, and even the EU uh, start to build a bit of a different, a new narrative regarding their relationship with China. Where is this going, do you think? First of all, thank you for the mentioning of the uh, Our World uh, magazine. It's for me an honor to have my name uh, in that publication with many uh, leaders. Uh, <laughs> so thank you also for inviting me to, to, to write uh, there. Because uh, as I told you, I, mean, I think that you know, the names there, it's an honor to be also you know, sharing this, uh, this publication. Second, uh, China. Uh, <clears throat> I do not forget where the crisis started. I do not forget that until December, China, the communist regime of China, did not say anything to anyone. And that the doctor or doctors that tried to announce this, uh, let's say, uh, were uh, silenced, hmm? uh, to speak in diplomatic terms. Uh, I do not forget that they could have done much more at the beginning. I also do not forget that the European Union sent 56 of tons of humanitarian aid to China when the news broke. Unfortunately, Alex, I have to mention this because this is not news. It's always news about what China is doing now, but this is also corresponding to the solidarity of Europeans, which at the beginning of crisis in China sent all this humanitarian aid to China. I have to say that uh, I hope that we are not in front of a propaganda uh, action, but on the contrary, that you know, I mean, maybe, maybe this could help also to ease the relations between China, the United States, European Union, and so on. If this is the line, I am happy with it, and I'm also a grateful person. All the help that's bringing now from coming from China is highly welcome, and I'm grateful for that. And we have to be grateful. But not forgetting, as I said, where, how all this was managed and where it started. Uh, because now it's not the case of China, but other regimes uh, like Russia are trying to do, you know, a clear propaganda about this. And then there is a final question. The publicity and the authenticity of the data that these countries are sending about the fight against coronavirus. I don't buy by a single minute that in Russia they have the numbers that they have. I don't buy this. Uh, I think, for example, my country, I think that one thing that Spain is doing is being very transparent with the data, as well as Italy. This is not new in history, by the way. It happened with the so-called Spanish flu in 1918. You know the story, Alex? Let me tell it to the viewers. Why is it called the Spanish flu? Mm -hmm. Where this flu was originated? Hello, it's... Uh, yes, I... Uh, we, okay, because oh. I have no image, but okay, I continue. This, this flu was originated in the United States, and it was brought by American soldiers who were fighting in the Western Front in the First World War. Spain at that time was the only neutral, one of the few very only countries neutral in the First World War. And it was the only one who publicized the date, the, the data of their deaths. And that's why it got the nickname of the Spanish flu, because other countries hide the numbers, uh, disguising them as deaths due to the war. What I'm trying to say with this historical fact is that we have to be very vigilant with who is telling the truth and who is not telling the truth with data in the fight against coronavirus. Because those of us who we are thinking in the future that we want to open immediately the frontiers for, to get commerce, to get uh, tourism, 
we will have to be very vigilant to which countries really can share with us. Are you going to go in a honeymoon to Malaysia in the next future? Do you have, do we have information about what's going on there? Claro, these are the kind of things that transparency gives. It gives security. And at the end of this story, maybe Spain or Italy, that they are, have been very transparent in this, they will, be, they will become the most secure countries in, this, in, in the next future. Uh, uh, I hope that everybody does the same, and also in the European Union. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your home country, Spain. I imagine you're, you're speaking a lot with the people back there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the situation is like? Terrific, uh, like in Italy, and uh, I hope that we all take all, and I am calling here to all European governments, to all governments around Europe, in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, to stick to these very unfortunate examples, to, to, to take the examples and to do their best not to follow the same line uh, of what happened in Spain. Of course, it took us all by surprise. Although the Spanish government, unfortunately, was notified days before allowing big manifestations in my country, in the Women's Day and so on, against all the advices coming from the Health World Organization or the European Emergency System, uh, decided to go on because the government in my country is very ideological. It's a mix of socialism and communism, and uh, they, are, they, they are more focused in ideology than anything else. This is a very unfortunate fact. Nevertheless, the situation in Spain today still is uh, the, the number of deaths and, uh, and uh, situation, horrific situation of lockdown that my fellow countrymen are living right now in Spain, which is far more uh, serious than any place in Europe, except Italy. Uh, the calls, the conversations that I have daily with friends, with family, uh, with also uh, persons connected politically and so on, it's uh, of, uh, of a very, very tough situation. And uh, they all wish, they, and this is something about the Spanish people, that they are great people, they all wish that others would not go through the same path as uh, we had suffered in Spain. The Spanish people, they have been historically and traditionally, they are very, very, they use a lot of solidarity. And, uh, and, and, and I'm sure about them, uh, that they wish the best. That's what I've been talking with many of them uh, for the rest of Europe. So uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna bring on, uh, you know, a representative from the WHO and a representative uh, from the pharmaceutical distribution industry. And so that's gonna be very interesting to talk to them about what the situation uh, is like. Um, I just wanted to ask you one last question and that relates to, to actually your job in the EPP. How has this been to handle the internal dynamics uh, between the member states of the EPP? Has it been easier because we need to come together or has it been more difficult? Because some people are saying there's a little bit more nationalism than usual. Uh, do you see this gray hair? <laughs> These are 19 years managing <laughs> the unity in this political family in the EPP. 27 European countries, uh, 82 member parties. It's never easy, Alex. It's never easy. If you are a Democrat and you respect diversity, you have to take into account everybody's opinion. That's why sometimes we are late. And people are right to criticize the European Union when they say we are late. But we are taking into account the opinion of 27 uh, member countries. And inside these countries, there are regional also realities. Because in some countries, regional realities are very diverse, like my own yeah. country, yeah. Spain or Belgium. And you have to take into account these diverse opinions. It's very difficult. It has taken me many nights without sleep to obtain common documents in the people. True. But at the end, we have them. At the end, we have them. And you know what? After all these, these documents are bulletproof. Because we have had to manage so much uh, so many decisions, so many people, so many cultures, 
political cultures together that at the end no one can go against that. It's a very fully democratic you know, uh, way of doing things. I'm very proud of it. I know, I know of the problems, I know of the bad things about the delays and so on. I am fully aware, but and this is something that maybe this crisis, like others, will bring to us uh, more, in this sense, more coordination and more seriousness from all of them. By the way, I'm not happy with the Council calling for 15 days of delay to take decision. I am not happy, I have to say it here. The European Council, the shareholders, the uh, governments, either they are from DPP, socialists, liberals, I don't care. They have to take decisions right now. They cannot leave this for 15 days. And this is a call that we are doing also from the EPP. Speed of reaction, effectiveness is what the people from all around Europe are asking from us. Antonio, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we've been live with uh, Antonio Lopez de the Secretary General of the European People's Party. Uh, and thank you very much, and we hope to have you on one of our, our future panels. I'm just going to promote uh, Monica Direct, who's going to be on our next panel. Thank you, Tono, thank you very much, uh, and goodbye for now. Thank you, thank you, Alice, and thank you for this opportunity, and uh, keep going on. Uh, we have to also tell people about the European experience, the realities. We have to be critical, but also knowing that this project is the only one uh, that can help us in this moment, like in many before. Yeah? And, uh, and the fight, we have to do it together. If I can use uh, this event, please, to all the viewers, if you are in different countries, please, this is a battle that we have to give all together. Like this, we will win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tono. Monica, welcome. Oh, you are still muted. Let me uh, see if we can unmute you here. Okay. So now we should be able to hear you. I will set myself, yeah. Great. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. So we're going to hopefully have uh, Monica Kaczynska from the uh, WHO also join us in a few seconds. Uh, but I will be, take the opportunity to, to start the discussion with you. Uh, so for those who don't know you, Monica Derek Fua is the Secretary General of JIRP, uh, and she is going to tell us exactly what JIRP's role is here in this process, because during this pandemic, uh, I think your organization has been instrumental for to helping fulfill some of the needs that exist in the member states, particularly as regards the distribution of uh, pharmaceuticals. So I, I'd like to just ask you, you know, what does your organization do and what is your role in this crisis? Yes, yeah, so SHIRP is the European Healthcare Distribution Association, amongst other services upstream and downstream the supply chain. Our members operate as full-line wholesalers, which means they carry the full assortment of medicines, medical devices and food supplements um, on permanence on stock and deliver them whenever and wherever needed uh, to pharmacies and to other, <coughs> sorry, and other uh, dispensing points uh, in Europe. Indeed, uh, we, we call ourselves as vital link in healthcare and we, we think we have a, a very important role. We have a very important role at the moment in this outbreak um, because it's essential that uh, the supply chain is kept up. It, it was quite challenging. I can you tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, to keep uh, the drivers going, to, to have them entering uh, in quarantine areas, so in the red zones in Italy, in Spain. Um, unfortunately, as we have heard from Antonio Lopez, situation is quite bad as well. Um, yeah, so our role is to bring the medicines from the manufacturers to the pharmacies, to hospitals, to clinics, and to self-dispensing doctors. Before and shortly after the lockdown, we have seen a, a real a surge in demand. Orders have like tripled to the normal volume we, we encounter. And uh, the workers had to, to make night shifts and everybody who was in in bookkeeping, accounting, uh, marketing, wherever in the companies. They were used to, to help commissioning the orders in the warehouse. And um, 
yeah, they have worked really around the clock with the night shifts and weekend shifts uh, to, to bring the medicines due to the surge of demand to the pharmacies who then could hand them out to the patients because everybody tried to, to fill their prescriptions to stock up on, on uh, self-medication uh, in order not to go out so often. And there was a real peak, uh, which now slowly uh, is getting back towards normal. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the production of pharmaceuticals and how that has affected you as well? Yeah, so as we all know, since a while, um, we get many APIs, which, which is active pharmaceutical ingredients from uh, China and from India. Uh, in China, of course, production was down for a while. And um, India has uh, introduced an export ban of a number of substances. Which, uh, which are needed. And on the other hand, uh, Italy, of course, could not produce for a while or cannot produce now. Uh, of course, uh, manufacturers have stopped, so this problem will not hit us on the short run. But uh, on the medium and long run, we believe there is still like six months of supply um, at manufacturers. Usually wholesalers keep between two and four weeks. Um, of, of buffer stock to be sure to, to be able to supply. And we, we will see uh, whether this can be caught up, this delay we have taken through the export bans and through, through the problem of um, that uh, production facilities did not operate for a while. So, I mean, coming to the actual distribution, uh, particularly of pharmaceuticals and the areas which have been hit the hardest, like Italy, can you tell us about what's going on there and what kind of challenges you faced? Yes, yeah, so a whole pharmaceutical wholesaling is a part of the critical infrastructure in almost all EU countries. And it's important that the drivers can, can pass the red zones, the quarantine zones, in order to, to bring the medicines to the pharmacies. Um, and there has been a lot of problems. There have been a lot of border problems. Um, now, I think all, almost all countries have uh, issued the certificates for the drivers, but also it's essential that the workers can go to work and can then commission and operate in the warehouse. Otherwise, uh, uh, the drivers have no feeling of their vans and also the vans were, were overfilled because uh, normally it, they are conceptual for, for normal supplies. Um, which was a bit harder than usual. Uh, yeah, with the green lanes, we very much support that uh, we have introduced them, that they work in some countries well, but uh, Antonio Lopez was referring to that, it's not really smooth yet. Um, and uh, the, the ideal would be that uh, you do not spend more than 15 minutes at the border crossing. Uh, this is uh, the objective to work together, but it is not reached yet. How, how has it been for you know some of the drivers who are actually making these deliveries? Are they they are at more risk than than most? Yes, yeah, so uh, it's, it's important that they have this uh, personal protection equipment necessary, and then uh, to avoid the contact when they deliver with a pharmacist. Um, so it it is better to put it. Um, in, in a kind of uh, secluded area uh, and to leave it there. Also, they try uh, several members in some countries try night deliveries. Then they just uh, put the medicines uh, and the pharmacists can receive them in the morning. But so yeah, personal protection equipment is a problem everywhere. So we're going to be listening uh, soon from uh, Luke Zelderloo, who's the Secretary General of EASPD, and he's going to be telling us uh, about the problems in the social ser services area, uh, about how particular groups, uh, people with disabilities, uh, old people are, are particularly affected by this. Um, but I just wanted to, to ask, you, ask you one last question. What kind of advice do you have for patients and also people around Europe seeking medicines? Some are needing them critically for their conditions. Some are hoarding them. Uh, others are taking medicine preventatively. Do you have any advice? I think also here we, we should plead for solidarity 
um, and people should only purchase or ask for the medicines they really need uh, because also other other patients need their medicines and uh, so no holding but uh, to be really reasonable and uh, just take what is actually needed and not to take the medicines away for somebody else. Monica Direct, thank you very much for being with us uh, and thank Jerp for, for doing this important job at this very difficult time. And I hope we can have you also on one of the next ones. With pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure joining you, Alex. Thank, thank you, Monica. So I'm gonna just bring up uh, Luke uh, Zelderloo. Um, hopefully uh, he will be with us in uh, as soon as I can just promote him to become a panelist. Um, unfortunately, we've had to uh, stop the web chat because we've had some people come in and um, use a lot of profanity for absolutely no reason. Uh, sorry about that and sorry for those of you who can see that. Um, Luke is with us. Uh, just just a oh. note before we get started with Luke, uh, we are supposed to have uh, Dr. Hans Puj uh, also show up uh, to this panel. Uh, there was uh, an emergency at the WHO, as you can imagine they often are during these days. Uh, we hope to have another representative from the WHO join us uh, during this stream. It's uh, now a matter of the technical issues <laughs> at hand and trying to, to get her to join uh, Zoom. Uh, but until that happens, we will continue with our regular flow. So with us now is Luke uh, Zelderloo, uh, who is the Secretary General of EASPD. And I think, Luke, the, the best thing to, to start is by just telling us a little bit about what your organization does um, and you know, wh what you've been doing here. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share the concerns uh, that, we, that we hear from, from the grassroots level uh, across the European uh, continent now on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, ESPD, European Association of Support Services for Persons with Disabilities, uh, is a European network. We represent around 17,000 organizations uh, active across uh, the continent, supporting persons uh, with a disability and, uh, and their families. And just to give you uh, an idea on, on the size of the sector in terms of employment, uh, the social services sector of which we are an, an important part employs well over 10 million professionals across the European Union uh, today. So it's a quite, uh, quite important sector. And I must say that uh, the, the messages that come from grassroots uh, organizations are um, worrying. Uh, and sometimes, uh, sometimes even shocking. Let, let me start first maybe with, with the good news. What I hear is that in many, many countries, in many, many organizations, there is such a level of flexibility and such a level of creativity, uh, innovation, that indeed uh, professionals, service providers, try to, through different ways, different methods, try to support uh, their, their users, their clients, uh, in, in a very effective way, also in these very difficult uh, times, through going digital, through going uh, in distance support type of models and so and so. Apart from that, what we hear also is, uh, is, is frightening. And I will give you a few examples. Um, in, in many countries now, the sector or a good part of the sector is in a sort of a lockdown, complete lockdown or, or partial uh, lockdown. And that means that uh, in many regions of Europe now, people that really need support are without this type of support. Even if the professionals, even if the support service providers would be willing to support uh, their people, they can't anymore. And that is bringing the support staff in a very difficult situation because they are in between being very loyal to their clients, to the people they want to support on the one hand, but on the other hand, also, uh, they understand, these professionals understand that their own health and the health of their family might be at risk when they uh, keep on uh, supporting. So there is a, 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 real, a real issue in the sector now. What about all these people that need personalized support but can't get it because of uh, the lockdown and all the issues uh, linked to that? 
So if, if, if I can just ask you, what are the conditions uh, in old people's homes and places where people with disabilities need help? What are the conditions like, you know, especially in the most problematic areas where the lockdown is much more severe? Well, I can summarize it in under three uh, uh, little examples, if you want. Uh, we received a message, and I will not uh, give you the name of the country, that will not be appropriate, I think, at the moment. But we received a message from a service provider that they can't get equipment to protect the professionals. Uh, no, no mask, uh, no protective clothing, no, uh, uh, no disinfection uh, gels. That is one of the first problems that I hear over and over again. Uh, services say that all the equipment is drained into the health sector and for the social services sector, it is so difficult to, uh, to, to find the needed uh, equipment. That's the first uh, problem that we see, uh, appropriate equipment to protect the staff. Second element is what we see that due to the triage system that is implemented in some regions, we see that persons with a disability, although quite often they are in, perfect, uh, in a perfectly healthy condition uh, before they, uh, they had the corona uh, virus, don't make it to the triage anymore. So what we see is a sort of a, a layer of discrimination that is added to all the other layers of discrimination that persons with a disability have to face already. So, so That's what, the second. What... What Sorry? does that actually mean? You mean so that someone who will walk into an ER uh, coughing, fever, ha half dying, um, but if he's in a wheelchair, they're going, to, even if he's 30 years old, they're not going to treat him? Exactly. Exactly. We receive uh, reports that indeed these type of uh, uh, things are happening now. And of course, we all hope that we will be able to, to reduce uh, the impact of the of this coronavirus, so that the hospitals can deal with uh, with the health needs of all people. But to me, this sounds like a real discrimination based on disability, which is, I think, very difficult to uh, to accept. Although I know that uh, health professionals have to do a terrible job uh, to to make these type of choices. On the other hand, it is, I think, not acceptable. The third type of problems that we see in the sector is that uh, certain, certain units where people are with very high support needs, uh, they, they lack staff so that some of these people, um, their diapers are not changed anymore or there is no staff available to, to provide food. So the, the basic essentials. Uh, what are needed uh, for, for quality care, for quality support, are not there anymore. And this is the reality in, uh, in some parts of Europe, and this is really uh, not, uh, not acceptable, I think. I'm sorry, did I hear you say, right, that the people who uh, cannot service themselves and uh, need to have, for example, diapers changed, cannot uh, have these very basic services? Exactly. Exactly. That's terrible and that's tragic. That is indeed terrible and, and thank God uh, in most regions and, and, and parts of Europe uh, still professionals with, with a lot of commitment uh, try to do whatever they can but there are also situations where the number of staff uh, is so reduced by the infection that uh, we, we, we have to face this type of, uh, of problems, yes. So it's about equipment, it's about basic rights the triage systems, and it is about having uh, uh, staff available to, to, prefer, to provide uh, uh, basic quality. Yeah. So I, I can imagine these, these professionals have been called upon, essentially requisitioned by governments and hospitals to try and deal with the, the front line of the situation. And I know it's not an easy decision to make um, as to who deserves, needs, uh, these these kind of uh, this kind of attention and who 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 gets to live and die ultimately, as you said in your your second um, example. But I wanted to maybe take to try and take a more positive approach and look at the day after, uh, because this coronavirus has impacted uh, what the budgets are going to look like. The the EU is trying to to set up its multiannual financial framework, and um, this is being affected uh, by the COVID nineteen pandemic. But tell me about social services particularly. What's the impact on them? 
in the long run you mean yes well in the long run uh, there is uh, there is the risk uh, that the the reaction uh, would be more or less the same as right after or at the beginning of the financial crisis uh, the reply quite often was cuts in social and i really hope that that uh, won't happen again across europe uh, the social service sector was slowly recovering from uh, the the financial crisis and now we have this crisis and i really hope that um, that uh, we will not have to face again five six seven years of very severe cuts uh, in our sector and i hope that by now uh, the decision makers uh, understood that the health sector and the social services sector has to be uh, supported in the correct way so that indeed these sectors uh, can build up resilience to deal with with this type of uh, of crises uh, apart from that we also hope that the european union will come in maybe a bit more active as said by the president of the of the epp we understand that it is difficult uh, nevertheless uh, what the people in europe wants now is a much more active european union and i really hope that the the union will not stay locked up in this economic discourse of course we know that it's absolutely important uh, to save uh, the enterprises and the employment uh, and, and 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 the markets we all understand that and we respect that but it is also important to understand the needs of the people at the moment so we want a more active european union understanding and addressing the needs of the people now uh, just uh we're going to uh, next have with us the president of the Association of European Journalists, uh, Otmar Dinsky, who is in Vienna at the moment, I believe. Uh, but before we move to him, I, I want to ask you, uh, you're not a politician, obviously, but uh, in terms of public opinion towards the EU, how is that going to change uh, after this crisis? Well, it is, it is, also that is a bit worrying. Uh, when you look at uh, and follow public opinion uh, trends in, in northern Italy, for instance, uh, there, is a, there is a strong, uh, a strong move tendency towards uh, blaming the European Union for being so slow and for uh, not addressing the real needs of the people. So there is uh, indeed, again, this risk that uh, populism will, uh, will rise and that people will turn away from, uh, from the uh, European uh, Union, which is, I think, uh, very sad because the European Union uh, is, and I'm really convinced of that, is, is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, the virus doesn't uh, stop at borders. So we have to find uh, cross-border solutions and we have to work uh, across, uh, across countries and build up solidarity to be able to, to deal with this uh, crisis. But public opinion is, is indeed, uh, uh, the temperature is rising. Uh, we should keep an eye on it. So I'm just going to bring in uh, Otmar Hadinski, who's going to be our, our next guest. Uh, but very quickly, as I'm doing that, uh, and just to end, how can people who want to help uh, connect with you? How can they connect to AASBD and then actually bring their themselves to, 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 to help you in this very special time of need? No. Yeah. We have set up uh, different uh, instruments uh, to be able to support our, uh, our colleagues, uh, directors, professionals in, in the field. We have set up uh, a Facebook page where we exchange models of good practice, share good ideas, uh, innovative uh, approaches to support the people. We also have our weekly webinar. Next week, we have uh, a colleague from China who was uh, in the very heart of the crisis from day one. And he will share ideas uh, with us on, on, on what to do and how to proactively anticipate. And thirdly, we have set up a help desk uh, as well. So uh, if you want to uh, uh, inspire us or work with us, uh, feel free to surf to our website, uh, which is espd.eu uh, uh, and uh, uh, work with us in fighting this crisis. Luke Zelderloo, uh, Secretary Thank General you very of the ASPD. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you. Bye, Alex. Bye. So uh, we're just going to have with us Otmar. Uh, Otmar, I've unmuted you. Uh, welcome to our panel. For, for those who don't know, Otmar Lachodinsky is the president of the Association of European Journalists. Uh, he has honored us at New Europe uh, with 
contributing uh, both to the newspaper and to our world, I believe. Otmar, how, how are you? Thank you, I'm fine. I'm uh, in a kind of self-chosen quarantine, uh, still healthy uh, with my uh, wife and, and a dog. And I'm lucky that uh, the Vienna woods is just behind my house so I can walk outside without uh, restrictions. Um, yeah, many people in Austria, especially in Vienna, um, they don't have this uh, opportunity and even some public uh, gardens have been closed, uh, unfortunately. Not all of them, but uh, the bigger ones like Schönbrunn. I want to cut right to maybe a pointed question because you're you're following the situation uh, quite uh, closely, and I think for a journalist who's now going a bit crazy that they cannot leave the house, uh, you're following all the media everywhere you can from the websites and the social media. Uh, and I wanted just for you to critique the EU's response. Has the EU been slow to respond? And, you know, I particularly looking at something, someone like the European Commission and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who's uh, not any more new to the role. Um, you know, I find myself asking WWJD, what would Juncker have done? Well, uh, I have, uh, have to say that, uh, unfortunately, I think the commission was really a bit slow. Uh, I mean, we all underestimated the scope of this pandemia, but uh, I mean, we have experts um, in Europe. You know, we have this uh, European Center for Disease Control uh, near Stockholm in Sweden. I looked at the homepage. Uh, I mean, they 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 didn't give a real warning. They 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 just uh, publish now statistics, all kind of statistics. But uh, and 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 we have the crisis commissioner, uh, Mr. Lenarčić uh, from from uh, Slovenia. He's our the commissioner responsible for crisis management, and uh, it is it is really a poor management because. I'm sorry to say that uh, he is a diplomat and a former politician in Slovenia, but uh, it would have been his job to uh, kind of warn all member states, hey, there is something coming up, please look at the medical supplies, um, maybe to start production, especially from these of these uh, respiratory machines who are now in 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 in, in uh, need in all all countries so we lost precious time uh, in in only on uh, one week ago uh, or, or 10 days ago on the 29th of uh, march he made a statement mr lenarcic the commissioner and he said uh, he will now without delay he said I will now, without delay, start procuring all these medical supplies. But I mean, what did he do before? And what did uh, this uh, European Center of Disease Control do? We lost precious uh, time. We lost some several weeks. Sorry, I'm having trouble uh, sometimes unmuting my, my microphone back and uh, forth. Uh, for, yesterday, you were on a panel also discussing uh, Hungary. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what uh, Premier Viktor Orban is doing there? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we had, by the way, we had a lot of problems uh, at our border with Hungary because the Hungarians, again, there was no coordination, no solidarity. I mean, every country did what it uh, thought is, is right to do. So everybody closed its borders. Uh, Germany, by the way, stopped uh, uh, goods um, paid and ordered by the Austrian government, medical goods at the border for, for weeks. and. I mean, this is uh, contrary to all our European single market rules. And, and uh, luckily, it was not the crisis commission. It was Mr. Breton uh, who apparently managed that these goods and then uh, finally arrived in, 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 in Austria. But back to your question, Alex uh, Sandros. Uh, Hungary, um, of course, it's worrying, uh, and, and especially also for journalists, it's it's a, it's a really a, a very tricky situation. 
we have now more or less a member country uh, among our 27 member countries of the European Union, which is approaching dictatorship. I mean, uh, yesterday, Mr. Orban uh, more or less got through in Parliament. The Parliament of Hungary dissolved itself on the more or less on the order of uh, the ruling party of Mr. Orban, the Fidesz party. And now he will go on ruling by decrees without parliament, without parliamentary control. And uh, for journalism, it's, it's worrisome that uh, there are now uh, arrest, uh, the jail penalties um, uh, possible, up to five years in jail if you promote fake news. But who is deciding, uh, who decides what is fake news and what not? So, I mean, uh, some, you know, he, he, uh, he has control more or less about 80% or more of, of media in Hungary. But the, the remaining independent media, uh, these journalists, they might go to jail if they start criticizing uh, some of the uh measurements uh, Orban does for the crisis. Of course, Orban excuses himself and he says, I do it uh, because it's, it's for the sake of the Hungarians. And uh, of course, when it's no longer needed, we will go back to parliamentary rule. But uh, it's, uh, it's him, it's his party more or less who can decide when the crisis is over. He can decide when the whole thing goes back to parliamentary control. And I'm really uh, concerned uh, that um, uh, about the silence of the European Union. Uh, the Commission said, oh, we're, going, we're going today. They said at the uh, lunch briefing, uh, video conference, they said, okay, we will. Uh, we will look and observe the situation in Hungary, but I think we have to uh, now, we are on the brink of uh, that the country, uh, neighboring country of Austria uh, becomes a dictatorship. So uh, we have to do something about it. Uh, and, and again, the silence of, of the commission is, is very bad. By the way, uh, my association, uh, today sent an open letter to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. They are also responsible mainly for media freedom. And uh, we urged them, uh, also the Council of Ministers of the uh, Council of Europe, uh, we urged them to, to do something uh, about Hungary, uh, to start this Venice, uh, to, to the, the Venice Committee, you know, all the uh, experts are there, the, the, the judicial experts, they should control the situation, uh, observe it, and then uh, give recommendations uh, to Hungary and to uh, the European Union what, what to do with it. So uh, those of you who might have joined quite recently our stream, uh, Admar Lahadinsky is the president of the Association of European Journalists. Uh, the call to governments that uh, you're talking about is available on the website of the Association of European Journalists. Mm -hmm. Very simple, aej.org. Uh, Otmar, I, you know, as you said, uh, on the border uh, with Austria, where you are at the moment, what is the situation like in Vienna? Tell, tell me about uh, how people are coping. How are you coping? Well, uh, it's uh, it's still possible to leave uh, to leave the house, uh, the, the homes. Uh, shops are closed, schools are closed since now two weeks. Austria was one of the first uh, countries uh, with these rather harsh measures. But you know, we are very close to Italy, uh, where um, lots of of uh, virus infections came from and uh, we have now something like uh, 9,000 uh, infected people from, from today and we have something like uh, 128 dead people in Austria. So it's still, and, and uh, the government wants to flatten the curve of, of infections and as that was done yeah, as almost every, every country uh, except white Russia. <laughs> 
um, also Sweden, interesting, Sweden uh, yes. has another way to, to do it, to cope with it. Uh, so, but if you go to, to Vienna, um, uh, it, you see empty streets and of course all the shops are closed, all the, the theaters and uh, museums are closed. So it's a kind of, uh, sometimes, especially in the evening, it's a kind of ghost town. Supermarkets, pharmacies, etc., are, are, are open. Uh, yesterday, our chancellor, uh, our government uh, started uh, a new uh, a, a new rule that uh, from tomorrow on, uh, if you go shopping in the supermarkets, you have to wear masks. The problem is uh, the supermarkets still don't know where they will get these masks. So again, we are here uh, again with the crisis, crisis commissioner, the, the, the panic supremo, so to say, um, he should have ordered uh, in, in the name of the commission, in the name of uh, Europe, more of these masks. So uh, from tomorrow on, all shoppers will have to wear masks, but uh, they, they don't know if there are uh, really enough masks for everybody. And uh, in, in, by the way, in Slovakia, another neighboring country, only one hour's drive from here, uh, they have since 10 days already, uh, you have to wear masks, not only in the supermarkets, but everywhere except in your home. So, uh, but it's rather tricky. Some people say it is not really helpful. Uh, it, it, it only helps people who are already infected and don't know that they are infected that they don't spread uh, the virus to other people through these masks. But uh, the testings in Austria, by the way, uh, um, they try to, uh, to widen it, but so far only 50,000 Austrians have been uh, tested, which okay. is of course for 9 million people, it's, it's not enough. Sure, uh, and I just see now a tweet from uh, the former U.S. ambassador to the EU, uh, Tony Gardner, who says it's time for the EPP to expel Fidesz. Um, so oh, people that's can go over. Uh, is, is, is Antonio still with us? Because that would be a, a no, question. No, no, no. He's. Uh, I don't know if he's still with us, uh, but uh, because, you know, this is a process uh, yeah. uh, that has been. He's still a member discussed. of EPP, uh, Mr. Orban. And uh, we, you know, there have, has been a committee of wise men and they didn't uh, achieve any report so far because they, the three wise men among the four of them is the former Austrian chancellor, Mr. Schüssel. Uh, and still he's silent uh, about it. And uh, but he, the commission gave the, the order to, to come out with a report, but it, uh, not the commission, sorry, the, the EPP um, made uh, yeah. the, but so but I, far I, we went for it, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on this very, very political yeah. and politicized issue because uh, the greater issue here is the pandemic. Um, this is an issue which, of course, politically has huge implications for the power balance in Europe and within the European political families that are uh, making up mm -hmm. the European Parliament and course, the council. Um, so, you know, we can definitely discuss that on a, on a future panel and get people from uh, all sides involved. Um, we're going to move to air a, an exclusive interview with Goran Marby, the president and CEO of ICANN Next. Uh, but before we do that, I just uh, wanted to ask you one last question, because you were very critical of the EU's response so far. So, uh, you know, I've asked uh, participants earlier about this as well. Do you think the EU is going to come out of this stronger or weaker? Hmm. Very good question, but uh, you know we still don't know. Uh, I made an interview with the president of uh, Eurochambre, you know the Union of uh, Enterprises in Europe, an Austrian, uh, Mr. Leitl, and he told me that uh, European Union could come out as the only free trade uh, champion uh, in the world because uh, he said this state capitalism in China, there is free uh, capitalism uh, in, the, in, the, in the United States, but they say United States first. Uh, but European, the European Union, 
uh, still believes, he, th he says, he still believes in free trade because uh, free trade is all what, what, what the single market is uh, about. And uh, it could help Europe to get out of the crisis stronger than, than other countries. So uh, what my concern also is that uh, I hope that the nation states, which now think uh, they have all the powers, they can do whatever they want, look at Hungary, uh, that these nation states who can't cope with the pandemic alone, as we see now, that these states will hopefully give powers back to the European institutions uh, at the end, uh, it will be a different uh, European Union, uh, but there is a danger that it might dissolve uh, if, if people think uh, we don't need it. So I think the European Union is still needed. And at the end of the crisis, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, European Union always came out of crisis stronger than before. So this is my hope, my personal hope, that uh, again with this pandemia, European Union will come out stronger. Let's hope for that. Otmar Lakondinsky, President of the Association of European Journalists. Thank you very much for being with us today and we hope we can have you on a future panel as well. Thanks for inviting me. Bye bye. Bye bye. So just as I um, change uh, Otmar out. Uh, so with us was supposed to be uh, someone from the WHO. Unfortunately, due to the crisis, uh, we can't really fault them for that. They haven't been able to join us. Uh, up next, I'm going to share with you an exclusive interview I did a few hours ago uh, with Goran, Joran Marby, the president of ICANN. Um, and that interview uh, was filmed because it's <laughs> when we started this panel, it was 6 a.m. Uh, where he is in uh, Santa Monica. So I'm going to stream that for you that, uh, live now. Uh, no one has seen this before. And it's as close to live as we can get. Oh. Sorry, let me um, do that once more because the audio was not set up. Okay, so here we go. So welcome back. We're here with Joran Marby, who is the president and CEO of ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's not often, Joran, that you get to, to hear the whole uh, acronym uh, uh, out loud, is it? No, that's actually, I had to think about what you said for a second. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. So uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking together about the internet, how it works, and of course, uh, ICANN is the organization that brings all the keys together so that the users can have an experience that is uh, what they have come to know as the internet. Uh, now with the coronavirus, we're seeing unprecedented usage of the internet and um, people are doing some very bad things with it. There's some abuse you were telling me earlier. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on at the moment and how I can and you step in to, to fix these things? Well, I, I can start by saying that um, what I can, I mean, I can as an institution that is, um, that is governed by what we call the community. And um, the, the, this means that we supposedly three times a year actually come together. Um, thousands of people from more, you know, more than 130, 140 countries uh, comes together to make decisions about policies about the domain name system. And uh, we actually decided to cancel the meeting we were supposed to have a couple of weeks ago in Mexico and turned what used to be a face-to-face -face meeting into um into a remote meeting and i can't remember how many people actually i think we had more than 14 1500 people during a period of i think it's about five days participating in in one big remote experiment uh where we had at one point in time 900 people on one conference call uh, uh, during a webinar wow. so that to say that this the 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 uh, this situation has had a profound effect on how we operate is, is an understatement. Um, luckily, it's worked out well. Um, and and uh, we are, as an organization, we're about 400 people uh, sitting all over the world as well. And we've all gone remote. Um, 
as you can make see on my even more casual clothing <laughs> style that I usually have sitting in my uh, study back in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and I most, I mean, we, I do a lot of calls and right now I'm, I, I sit in my room and I, 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 that's, I speak to a lot of people around the world. But to answer your question, well, ICAT has, a, uh, has one of the roles when it comes actually to have the ability to what people call the internet which are we are providing what we call the identifiers um, uh, names uh, numbers protocols um, we are together with our technical partners uh, in this ecosystem helping uh, internet access to exist um, all of course provided by the um, telcos and isps around the world which are the end users interface to the internet and we see that um, we see that traffic are increasing. Uh, there are more requests to resolvers, there are more people online, but from our perspective, uh, from this, this core functionality, we haven't seen any, we're not even close to, to having any problem at all. Um, so at least I can say from our perspective that we don't see the enormous problems with the uh, increased usage. So the bottlenecks are other, other in other places in the system? I mean, I think that uh, what one of, I mean, especially in the mobile sector, I presume, um, when God created Spectrum, he did a limited amount of Spectrum, and if everybody goes on the same base stations, um, there is not enough capacity, and I think that's where one of the areas is seen, which it also shows the importance, and I'm talking outside ICANN now, the importance of having fixed infrastructure as well. Um, uh, the internet, the way we do it, provide, it goes on both. Uh, which is important, which is actually a feature that, that independent of the uh, connectivity you use, uh, you use the same internet. Uh, and I think at this point in time, it shows how important that is. Um, I mean, there have always been uh, organizations and people and companies who want to do a mobile internet or a fixed internet or create different kinds of internet. But the fact that you can go online using your Wi-Fi, your fixed network, your mobile network, and always the same internet right now, is also taking away some of the problems with uh, interconnectivity, the fact that you can go online. What we do work with a lot is that, of course, there are bad actors uh, who try to utilize this situation. And we, we call that, with, with lack of better words, we call it domain abuse. Um, People setting up websites, um, selling have fake you, tests. Have, have you been seeing, yes, seeing something new uh, happen now with this coronavirus pandemic? I mean, so what we've seen, and, and when I say we, I say we in a much broader sense, because here we work in a, in a fairly large system of, of people who provide domain names, uh, sells domain names, manage domain names. Um, and and we, yes, we have seen an increase of, of people who would like to abuse these things, uh, I think Europol just made a report uh, saying that they also have seen an increase of, you know, you know, the typical example is a web page where someone sells a fake test yes. or recommends something. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that the whole, this part of the internet has risen a lot to a challenge. Uh, I'm working very hard and working together uh, to make sure that the, uh, these can happen as, 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 as little as possible. Because, of course, people are, I mean, everybody sits at home, everybody surfs, and everybody looks at information, everybody reads news stories, and everybody's looking for the sort of silver bullet for a solution. And when you find a web page that prevents that, maybe you have, you, you know, normally you wouldn't pay attention to it, but now you do. Yeah. So do we are work, that's one of the major issues, not only for ICANN, but for everybody who's sort of in, related to the domain name industry. And, and so what exactly uh, is your role in this respect? So there's these uh, websites set up, they sell fake, te fake tests. So where, where do you come in as ICANN to stop that from happening? So what ICANN does is that we work, we know first of all very much about how the DNS system works. And we often become a col collaborator and, and a in source of information uh, to the ones who actually do the work. Um, the, the owners of domain names, or the resellers of the domain names, are the ones who does the physical work. We often uh, become the link between uh, legal services and other ones, uh, and sharing information. So we, 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 when it, technically there's nothing we do when it comes to what is called takedowns and such, but we are often 
a think tank in now a very active think tank how to work with this with the, with the rest of the uh, players in the domain and industry yeah if i can just take a second i, I wanted to um just uh, plug our website we're doing a fantastic job with this um where we have a at new europe we have a vaccine and drug development uh, constantly update, updated by our team who is day and night finding the most important news about what's going on with drugs with vaccine development that's the one thing i wanted to talk about the second thing i wanted to talk about is um you're on you are one of the alumni of our world you've uh, been kind enough to participate with uh, your article this year on our 10th anniversary edition, the future in the internet of the internet in the 2020s. So uh, I look forward to some of our viewers uh, logging on and reading that. It's, uh, it's very valuable and uh, I'm sure they'll find it interesting. Um, you can also pick thank up- you for calling me, Thank you for calling me old. Old, I didn't call you old. When did I do that? Alumni. Oh, wow. You know, you took part in this and it's, uh, it's a great publication. I, I hope you've received your hard copy by now. If you haven't, it's, uh, it's in the office somewhere where you cannot go, unfortunately. Um, but getting back to our conversation, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the problems the internet is facing, you know, what the end users are facing at the moment, whether it's our video stream or a little bit later when we go on to stream some sort of movie somewhere, is we see a lot of the platforms are throttled in content. Um, so what's going on there? Uh, are we really asking organization to to do that on purpose and what happened to all these years of fighting over this kind of regulation net neutrality and all the rest of it I mean, this is not uh this is not i can turf uh we we stay away from any discussions about net neutrality or uh, um, the content side of internet that's the, the many better organizations around the world um have opinions about that we are very strictly um, into providing a service to the world and, and then it's sort of up to the world to manage it. But with that said, I could say we, network management is something that everybody does. All operators need to be able to manage the network to, uh, to make sure that traffic flows through those, uh, through, through those networks. And especially mobile networks, they, they have to do this. So I, I, sometimes I think we, we, we sort of miss something. We, this is not an ICANN opinion, but I think that sometimes we misuse the word net neutrality for also the needed use of, of network management to make sure that the network actually works. Uh, it's a technical thing. It's not magic in any way. It's hard technical work uh, to make networks flow, and especially when the traffic uh, increases as much as it apparently has done over the last uh, couple of weeks. So looking at the future, uh, is 5G going to come and solve up all of that? What can we do to make sure that the infrastructure is there to help us through the crisis like these uh, when they come up? Maybe I am old uh, because I've been through 2G, 3G, 4G, and now it's 5G. From Icon's perspective, we actually see some risks with 5G as well. I mean, 5G is a fantastic opportunity to uh, for, for using spectrum more efficiently uh, to be able to provide higher speeds uh, for mobile users. What we do see are some tendencies when it comes to some of the proposals with 5G is to go away from what I believe or we believe is one of the good things is that everybody could access the internet from any type of device anywhere. Um, because some of the suggestions in the 5G space is sort of to build a mobile internet. Uh, which is only contained within the mobile network. And there's been proposals to go away from the current IP protocol um, to, to really go down and, and create services uh, or standardization of services that only exist in mobile. And we, of course, I mean, from, from my camp perspective, we have no business stake in this. We, we you know, we, we uh, are not doing this for, for uh, uh, we, we are not part of the model for business in this one, but we, we do think that we have a fairly strong voice when it comes to making sure that everybody should be able to access internet on any type of device. And if you don't do that and you sort of splint up the internet uh, because of technical reasons, I think a, a big value of the internet uh, will disappear because now everybody can go online, uh, everybody can reach everybody who's on these networks, and I think that is one of the reasons why internet has been so extremely successful. 
I mean, in, in a way, it's a fantastic thing that you are sitting in Brussels. Uh, I'm sitting in Los Angeles, um, and we can able to, with, with the help of this technology, without asking anyone, uh, we are set up this call. Indeed. And, and so I, I am, as always, a little bit, when it comes to new technologies that are going to change the world, uh, maybe because I am old, and I've been around for a long time, maybe slightly cynical, but I want to put out a warning when it comes to words like uh, other alternative IP protocols, um, uh, which are not IP in the first place, or uh, uh, the, the way some of the proposals are in the 5G space. I lift my eyebrow, that's very Swedish, to say that just make sure that we don't make mistakes here so not everybody can connect all the, all the, all the time. So to all the regulators and policy makers who are going to watch this, that's a very clear message uh, from a man with a I lot think of experience. The end, I actually think the end users, um, because I don't think end users of the world uh, would like to be locked into a technical model. Um, and, and so I think in the end, from a business case perspective, and this is maybe the, the silver lining on this cloud, is that I don't think internet users around the world would like to go to a model where they are prohibited of accessing certain types of information because suddenly they're on this wrong network. Um, I don't think you want that. I don't think the 4 billion internet users today wants that either. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, let me ask you a question. In initially, when I had thought about this, um, it was meant to be as a, a quirky, funny question to, to end our chat. But the, the, the more time that passes, I see more and more people who are seriously considering this. And there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. They're saying the pandemic is somehow related to 5G testing in Wuhan and in Italy because there's a lot of base stations, more people are getting sick. I mean, what, what do you say to this? Because there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation out there. And there is a tendency of people to jump onto the, the bandwagon when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, this is also outside sort of ICANN's remit, but I, I, I as you noted before, I, I, I was also a telecom regulator uh, for a long period of time, and I think that um, I, I learned about a lot of those uh, fears. And one thing that I, I learned during my years as a regulator is that you should take, you should actually, you should listen to people uh, who has fears. Um, you might not agree with them, and you should spend your time convincing them. But I think right now, in this particular moment of time, uh, I think that we're all going to be valued, not on the on harsh decisions we make or everything else. It's about kindness. And I think that right now, we have to be kind to people because people are afraid of so many things. I mean, I'm in a lucky situation. I'm sitting in my house. Um, I can pay my rent. I, I know that I can get groceries. Um, my uh, my uh, teenage kids are exercising social distancing with me perfectly. Uh, but, you know, there are people in this country, here in the U.S., and many other countries around the world who lost their jobs, lost their income, uh, lost, lost their opportunity to, to, to provide for their families. And in this period of time, there's going to be a lot of anxiety over all this. And I think that for the moment, we need to be listening mode we need to be understanding mode even if that's not the problem or that conspiracy is right or wrong but kindness uh, during this period of time is underestimated i think so i'm not going to go out and say that that's that's stupid or that's strange or something i want to listen into the reason why people have those fears um and i'm, I'm i think that we all who are people who sits in a situation to to uh, just be nice to people right now. Uh, that's a good avenue going forward. Yaron, thank you very much. That's uh, Those are some very wise words, and I hope that you and your family can stay safe during this uh, quite difficult time, even though you are in a very beautiful part of the world. And I hope we can have more of these chats in the future. Thank you, my friend, and take care of yourself as well. And say hello to your dog for me. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that was Joran Marby, President and CEO of ICANN. Um, this is going to conclude our, our stream for today. Thank you very much uh, for watching us from pretty much around the world. Uh, we did have a problem promoting this. Uh, Facebook is being very difficult with uh, advertising events. Anything that says 
COVID-19 or coronavirus on it gets immediately rejected by their algorithm. Uh, we hope that we're going to be able to at least advertise the video after the fact. Uh, once again, thank you very much for being here. We are going to have more of these uh, in the next few weeks. We're going to try and keep them to one a week and have them as a digital, a small digital conference, as, you, as you've seen. So we're signing off here from New Europe's headquarters, or at least what I have temporarily made New Europe's headquarters at my house. Uh, thank you very much and have a great afternoon.